Hi guys, so as July comes to a close, it will have been exactly one year and six months since I started my PhD. Now I've had a few people recently, actually I've had people ever since I started my PhD asking how my PhD is going, um, but a few people have asked recently and I thought perhaps this might be a nice time to do a bit of an update on the past year and a half of my PhD. Now I'm a part-time PhD student, so by my rough calculations a year and a half is similar to a year of a full-time PhD. Uh, you don't take exactly double the time to do a part-time PhD as you do to do a full-time PhD. So I'm going for this is roughly a year in the life of a PhD student or a year and a half in the life of a part-time PhD student. But it's all so relative and individual when it comes to PhD studies that it's really irrelevant anyway. Yep. <laughs> but maybe this will give you a bit of an idea of what to expect if you're going into a PhD. Since this is the first dedicated PhD update video I've done, I should probably tell you a little bit more about uh, what my PhD is, who I am. I am doing a PhD at the University of Roehampton, which is in the south of London. I am studying in the Classics department. I did Classical Studies and Classics for my undergrad and Masters at the University of Edinburgh. And now I'm researching an aspect of Ancient History or Classical Studies for my PhD. The actual working title of my PhD as it currently stands is The Politicisation of Sexual Assault in 4th Century Athens. I'm not going to go into an incredible amount of detail about uh, my specific research in this video as this is going to be more of a general overview but I will obviously touch on that and kind of how I came to that title as well since um, that is not the title I started with, that is um, not what I went into my PhD with, it's become a lot more specific and narrowed down and um, better formulated as time has passed. I'm not really sure where to start, I haven't really made any notes so I guess I'm just going to jump in and hope that uh, something interesting comes out. So I'm doing a part-time PhD like I mentioned, so when I applied for my PhD back in 2015 I applied uh, whilst I was coming to the end of my masters, I think it was around springtime, as I was just starting to write my dissertation for my masters, so I applied, I had my interview. I got accepted to do my PhD at Roehampton, which I was thrilled about because uh, the supervisors and staff there were amazingly qualified in those areas, in the areas I study of violence, of myth, of gender studies, of law and oratory, all the things I tackle. So, of course, I was absolutely thrilled to get that place. Unfortunately, I didn't win the funding that I had applied for. So I had a place to do a PhD at the university, but I didn't have any funding. I then was offered some funding to cover my fees, which of course was amazing. Fees are thousands of pounds. So although they're not as expensive as undergraduate fees in England, it was still a massive burden taken off my shoulders. And I thought, you know what? part-time with my fees funded, I can make this work. I had to do it part-time because I needed to work <laughs> to subsidise my life, <laughs> you know, rent, food, all of those kind of things. At that time though, I was still working in retail in Edinburgh at, you know, a tiny bit over minimum wage, like 10p over minimum wage, and doing a little bit of freelance work here and there. So I didn't have the means to actually move to London, where the university was based, uh, but I discussed that with my supervisors and uh, we said it would be okay to start things off at a distance. So I began my PhD in January of 2016 as opposed to September of 2015 and did about the first seven or eight months from Edinburgh. Whilst I was doing my PhD part-time from Edinburgh, I was also looking for uh, more substantial work that was located in London so that I could, you know, afford to live there and pay rent and eat all, you know, priorities, <laughs> even for students. So, as time passed, I eventually found a job. As you know, I work at Pan Macmillan, which are a publishing house. I work there four days a week, which, you know, covers the uh, absolute necessities of life, thankfully, and I am able to then fit in my PhD in the evenings and the three days I don't work at Pan Macmillan. I am roughly expected by the university guidelines to do about 20 to 30 hours of research a week and then obviously I work. So between work and, and studies I do more than a full-time job but 
I love my PhD studies, so I try to remember that when I can't to hang out with my friends sometimes and <laughs> I have to do my studies because I really do enjoy them and I find a lot of pleasure out of them and I have made this decision and I'm very lucky that I had the option to even make this decision so I'm not complaining but I think if I'm talking about my first year and a half of PhD studies having all of those obligations that I need to work um, fitting everything in the time that I do have has certainly impacted my life and my studies and my work over the past year and a half so it's definitely worth considering if I'm talking about like a one year, one and a half year experience. The first seven or so months when I was still living in Edinburgh were good, it was amazing that I could work from Edinburgh. I was able to use the library at Edinburgh University as an alumni student and even take out books so that was incredibly helpful. I could get the train down to London but obviously it wasn't a long term plan for me anyway. It definitely made things a little bit harder. Train tickets are expensive, the train is over four hours long, it's not something you can do every like second week. I always knew I needed to get to London to make my life a little bit easier. For access to materials and my supervisors as well as just feeling a little bit more a part of the academic environment at the university and since I've moved to London I have definitely felt that um, although I have a lot of commitments outside of university that take up my time, I still feel like I've been able to get a little bit more into the academic environment but with a PhD you don't necessarily need to be in uni every day. I don't have classes. I have access to certain classes that I can do but there's no classes in the sense of your undergraduate studies and, and essays and things like that. In terms of classes that are available to me and this is one of the things unfortunately working almost full time for weekdays out of the week has restricted me a little bit on my ability to kind of partake in extracurricular things. I wouldn't call any of it extracurricular because it's stuff you need to do eventually. There's a lot of methodology classes that are available, there's classes on developing your teaching skills because a lot of PhD students teach um, and, and all of these kind of things that are available to me as a PhD student which I haven't been able to do as many of as I would really have liked to in the past year and a half but that's because I quite literally couldn't <laughs> um, and I will make it work and it's been a bit of a learning curve balancing all of the stuff that I have to do you know I've still got quite a few years left I am sure I will be able to cover all my bases over that time and I'm still pretty happy with the stuff I have managed to achieve in the past year and a half and I certainly don't think I have been held behind in my actual research, it's more just those extra things that you want to be doing and that also applies to things like writing academic articles, I would love to be spending a lot more time writing academic articles for submission to journals and things like that or conference papers that I've necessarily been able to but it's a balancing act and Practice makes perfect. I have managed to achieve a few things. I wrote a short article for the Dangerous Women's Project which was inspired by my research which I was really pleased with. It was a small thing but you know big for me and then I even got to give a paper at Roehampton University based on that uh, article. If you want to read that article I'll link it down below. Um, I've also managed to teach a couple of classes and I have managed to give a paper at the student conference which are all important things and I'm really glad that I managed to do those. I also recently submitted a paper for a much bigger conference so I don't know, wish me luck. I, I would love to be able to give that paper um, but we'll see. I won't find out until the end of August or something. In terms of real PhD progress, in terms of things that are mandatory or marked, that kind of thing that I've completed, I have completed the first major step in my PhD which at Roehampton is called an RDB2. Every university is different but the first step is was essentially filling in this form that was basically a elongated more developed version of my original PhD application. So obviously I wrote a PhD application with ideas of what I wanted to study and then about a year in in terms of part-time PhD students, I think it's maybe more like eight months for full-time PhD students, I had to submit this RDB2 form as it's called at Roehampton which was a 
updated version. It was much more specific. By this time I'd narrowed down my research much, much better. I was able to discuss what I'd achieved so far and where I was going to go and just had a much better idea of what I was doing. And I think this goes for most PhD students who go into their PhD, some maybe not, but a lot of PhD students in my area at least go into their PhD with very broad ideas. You might not think it's really broad when you start, but you soon learn that it is incredibly broad and you narrow that down and a lot of that first year is spent reading material, narrowing it down, picking what you specifically want to focus on, um, developing a better plan, at least that's what it's been for me. So I did that and since then have been working on writing up um, chapters and bits of chapters and things like that. So I submitted the RDB2, I passed the RDB2, I'm still a PhD student, that was all great. The next step for me at Roehampton is an RDB3. The RDB3 though involves actually submitting an entire chapter of your thesis rather than just a bit of a literary review and a plan like the RDB2 was. So that's what I'm working on whilst working on writing up actual chapters because that contributes to the next stage. But like I said, I managed to really narrow down my topic in this past year and a half. I'd managed to narrow it down obviously before I submitted the RDB2 which was uh, a year in and what I went into really when I started my PhD was I want to study the representation of sexual assault against women in Greek literature. It was basically that broad. I mean there was a little bit more specifics to it than that but you know it was pretty much that broad. But what I have managed to do is to narrow down to a very specific subset of texts. I'm looking specifically at 4th century Athenian rhetoric and a specific cross-section of references to sexual assault within those texts and their uh, politicisation, their use by the orators and to what effect they're being used and why and what this reflects about wider attitudes to sexual assault in 4th century Athens. So my focus are you know, a very small, specific cross-section. Obviously, comparing and contrasting and examining alongside what else exists, um, nothing exists in a vacuum, so my awareness of all of the other references and that preliminary research that helped me to narrow down what I'm looking at is all still very relevant to what I'm looking at now, but I am giving specific attention to these specific passages and speeches and texts, if that makes sense. So a lot of that first year was narrowing it down, getting a real focus and preliminary ideas of where that research is going. So I have preliminary interpretations of the evidence that I am working to see if they're true or false or to what extent they're true or if there's contradictions within that, you know, I'm, I'm still doing the research, I don't have a final, final conclusion, but I have some ideas. And like I said, since I submitted that RDB2, I have been working on writing up chapters. So one thing I did was write up a first chapter of my PhD thesis, not the introduction, but the first chapter, which was about 11,000 words, and I looked at with my supervisors, I might not even be a chapter anymore. That information, although still important and relevant to my thesis, may disseminate throughout the rest of the thesis as opposed to being a whole chapter in itself. So I might have written 11,000 words that aren't going to be exactly the way they are now in the final thing and that's completely fine. So I did that and I'm now working on um, one of the central chapters of my thesis. I've also managed to make it to a few conferences over the past year and a half, a few day ones and then a few much bigger ones. There was a specific Rape in Antiquity conference held at my university, which was obviously incredibly relevant to my studies. I also managed to go to the CA or the Classical Association conference, which was held in Kent this year um, and is the largest classical civilizations ancient history conference in, in the UK. And that was an amazing experience and I'm really enjoying going to more things like that and being part of the academic atmosphere it's very inspiring and it's great to talk to people from your field. I think I touched on it before as well I've managed to do a little bit of teaching which I've really enjoyed it was my first exposure to really teaching undergraduate students and yeah I, I really enjoyed it. 
I would like to do more, hopefully in the future. I'm not sure what else to say now. <laughs> I feel like I've been talking for ages and I'm not even sure what I have said in this video, but hopefully it was interesting. If there's any specific aspects of my PhD that you'd like to hear about, PhD life, research, my studies, whatever, let me know because I'd be more than happy to do more regular PhD videos but I think they'd need to have more specific focus than a year and a half in the life of a PhD student. <laughs> I will probably take around five years to complete my PhD for those of you that are interested. That's a rough estimation. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of what stage I'm at. But one thing I can say about the past year and a half is despite all the ups and downs uh, within my personal life, work life, university life, and everything I've had to juggle, I know one thing and that is that I still adore classics and that doing this PhD was absolutely wholeheartedly the right decision for me and I don't regret it one iota and yeah I love it and I can't wait to keep going and you know see where my academic career takes me. But I'd love to hear from you in the comments if you've got any questions or if you have experience yourself with being a research student or a graduate student and you'd like to talk about your experience because I find it so fascinating. I love watching YouTube videos about uh, studying and research and all of that kind of stuff. There are a few channels I'm subscribed to that uh, deal with those kind of areas so if you're interested in them I will link them down below um, so you can go and check them out and until next time guys happy studying, happy reading and I'll see you all again soon. Bye!